arrogance. Arrogance is a feeling of superiority that makes itself known or manifests itself in an overbearing manner, uh, such as excessive boasting. Those who are arrogant tend to exaggerate their own worth, their own value. I, me, and my are heavily used in the vocabulary of someone who is arrogant. Pride is very closely related to arrogance. In fact, in the Hebrew, uh, the prime of both the word pride and arrogancy come from the same prime uh, root. We'll cover that in our lecture today. Arrogant people are often on an ego trip. If you revere and serve God, you should hate evil. You should hate uh, those who are prideful and also those who are arrogant. You know, evil, pride, and arrogancy are all characteristics of Satan himself. In fact, as that was his downfall. Uh, Satan believes he is worthy of sitting on God's throne. In fact, as he thinks, he believes he will replace God eventually. This is the very height of arrogancy. We will document these statements in a moment, but first I want to take a look at another character in the Bible that was arrogant. Open your Bibles uh, to 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1, as we ask that Word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name, Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Second Kings chapter 5, verse 1, and it reads, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, which would have probably been Benadad II at this point in time, was a great man with his master, and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria, probably from the Assyrians. No, don't confuse Assyria with Syria. They're two different countries, nations. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. Jesus would refer to this one Naaman in the New Testament. Luke chapter 4, verse 27. Jesus said there were many lepers in Israel, but God chose this Gentile, a, a Syrian, to heal of his leprosy. And the Syrians had gone out by companies, marauding bands throughout Israel, and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. She was taken uh, captive and made a house servant for Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Naaman's wife, would God, my Lord, Naaman, were with the prophet that is in Samaria. She's referring to Elisha by name. For he would recover him of his leprosy. Well, this little maid has faith, but it appears to me her faith is in the wrong place. She's putting her faith in Elisha, not the one who gives Elisha power to do the things, the miracles that he did. And one went in and told his Lord, this is the king of Syria, saying, thus and thus said the maid that is in the land of Israel, reported all that the maid had said concerning uh, Elisha the prophet. And the king of Syria said, go to, go, this to Naaman, go to Samaria to this prophet, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. And a lot of gifts that he's taking with him. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel. This would be Jehoram at the time, one of the sons of Ahab who became king of Israel. Saying, now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Nahum and my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. Here he is, curing. Now, being a Gentile king, 
Benadad too didn't think there was anything wrong with what he'd said. You know, it's your country. The prophet lives in your country. Have your prophet heal him. Jehoram, Jehoram will take it the wrong way. And it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. He knew Naaman was the captain of the host of the Syrian army. He says, he's thinking to himself, he's come here to spy out to see our defenses and they're planning on attacking Israel. What did Jehoram meant by am I God? The, the word for leprosy in the Hebrew is uh, zaroth. It's from the prime zaroth, which means to strike. And indeed, one who had leprosy was seen as one who had been stricken by the Lord. And what Jehoram is saying is God struck him with leprosy. And here, Benadad is asking me to cure him. I, who am I to cure whom the Lord has struck? And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, he was scared, that he sent to the king saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? What, what's the problem? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel, that, that there's a prophet of the living God in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And this would have been a long journey for uh, Naaman and his troops all the way from Syria. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him saying, go wash in Jordan seven times. Seven, as you know, in biblical numerics is spiritual perfection. And thy flesh shall come again to thee and thou shalt be clean. Naaman, that's all you have to do to be cleansed of your leprosy is go dip yourself seven times in the Jordan. It seems simple enough, doesn't it? But Naaman was wroth. And he went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me, referring to Elisha, and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. The strike his hand in the Hebrew is to move up and down. He, he wanted uh, kind of a circus sideshow. To, to happen. And Elisha, he didn't even come out to see him himself. He sent a messenger. I, th I think Naaman was offended by that. Naaman continues, are not Abana and Farpar, rivers of Damascus, these are rivers in Syria, better than all the waters of Israel? And this said arrogantly, May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. I could have washed seven times in the Abana or the Farpar, rivers in Syria. And here we see his pride. Aren't those rivers better than all the rivers of Israel? And his servants, Naaman's, came near and spake unto him and said, My father, this is a, a title of honor or affection, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? Yes, probably. How much rather then when he saith to thee, wash and be clean? I mean, it's no great thing that he's asking. And boss, we've tried everything else and nothing has cured you of your leprosy. Why, why don't you just, and it's no great thing that Elisha asked you to do. Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child. You've heard soft as a baby's bottom. That's what Naaman's skin became like. And he was clean, cleansed of his leprosy. Now, did Elisha do this? No. The Lord cleansed Naaman 
And this is going to have a, should and will have a tremendous impact on Naaman, as we'll see. And he returned to the man of God, would have been about 30 miles to Elisha's home. He and all his company and came and stood before him. And he said, Behold now, I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. Take a, take a present from me. You remember back in verse 5, he brought uh, 10 talents of silver, 6,000 pieces of gold, and 10 changes of raiment. Elisha responds, but he said, as the Lord liveth before whom I stand, before I serve, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused, any, uh, avoiding any appearance of selfishness. And Elisha knows he didn't heal Naaman. It was God who healed Naaman. And he didn't want to take credit for what God had done. And Naaman said, Shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant, to me, in other words, two mules burden of earth? For thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods, small g, but unto the Lord. What Naaman's asking for here is some soil from Israel to be loaded on two donkeys so that he can take it back to Syria with him so that when he offers a sacrifice to Yahweh, the God of Israel, he could be standing on soil that came from Israel. The heathens believed that it, the God of the land, in other words, he needed to be standing on some land from Israel to worship the God of Israel. In this thing, the Lord pardoned thy servant, Naaman continues. But when my master, the king of, 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 of Syria, goeth unto the house of Rimon, this is the Syrian storm god, to worship there, and he leaneth on my hand. In other words, I'm in service to him. And I bow myself in the house of Rimon, will I bow, when I bow down myself to the house of, in the house of Rimon, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. I have to act like I'm worshiping Rimon because my boss, the king of, uh, of Syria, worships Rimon. But will God forgive me if I do that? And he said unto him, go in peace. He didn't really answer his question, did he? So he departed from him a little way. And of course, we know today that it doesn't matter where you are, it's who you worship. And you can worship Yahweh anywhere you are in the, in the, the world, in the universe for that matter. We could stop right there, but the next eight verses is a tremendous lesson in greed, and I want to go ahead and cover them. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master hath spared Naaman, the Syrian, in not receiving at his hands that which he brought, the gifts. But as the Lord liveth, he's swearing, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. It would be a shame for Naaman to have to take those 10 talents of silver and those 6,000 pieces of gold and those 10 changes of raiment all the way back to Syria. So Gehazi followed after Naaman. And when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from the chariot to meet him and said, is all well? In the Hebrew this, is it peace? And he, Gehazi said, all is well, my master, referring to Elisha, hath sent me, that's a lie, saying, behold, even now there be come to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Elijah had established schools for the prophets. Uh, and, he, and of course, he was the mentor for Elisha. Give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of garments. I wouldn't ask for myself, but there are these two poor students. Give them a talent of silver and two changes of raiment. 
Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, you can't serve God and mammon. Mammon, you could consider these two talents of silver and two change, uh, one talent of silver at this point and two changes of raiment to be mammon. And Gehazi is serving the mammon, the ill-gotten gains rather than the Lord. And Naaman said, be content, knock yourself out, take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garments and laid them upon two of his servants. He's even gonna have two of his servants carry his ill-gotten gains for him. And they bear them before him. Always test the fruit, beloved. If someone does what Gehazi does, their fruit is bad. It's not, they're not serving the Lord. And you always wanna go with those who are serving the Lord. He's a liar, he's a hypocrite. And when he came to be to the tower of the city, in other words, he took them, the two talents of silver, from their hand and bestowed them in a house. He hid them and he let the men go and they departed. Well, Gehazi certainly is a lucky man, isn't he? Or is he? But he went in and stood before his master. And Elisha said unto him, Whence comest thou, Gehazi? And he said, Thy servant went no whither. No, no place special. Liar. And Elisha already knew. And he said unto him, Went not mine heart with thee, when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? Is it time to receive money and to receive garments, which he had, silver and the raiment, and olive yards, and vineyards, and sheep, and oxen, and men servants and maid servants. What else would you take? What's your price, Gehazi? What's your price? I hope you said, there is no amount of mammon that would come between me and my Lord. The leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from the presence, a leper as white as snow. If you revere the Lord, you should hate evil, pride, and arrogancy. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter eight as we continue our study. Just after the book of Psalms, you've got Proverbs We're going to pick it up with uh, chapter 8, verse 1. And we have wisdom speaking. Doth not wisdom cry or, or call out, you could translate. And understanding put forth her voice. She wants you to utilize her. She wants you to listen to her. She standeth in the top of the high places. She calls you from the mountaintops and the valleys, I'll add by the way in the places of the paths where you would have uh, a lot more traffic, in other words. In other words, uh, wisdom is not hiding. She, she's calling to you. Do you listen? She crieth at the gates, the place of judgment at this time, at the entry of the city, at the coming in at the doors. Unto you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of man. O ye simple, Moffat translate this, heedless souls. In other words, unsuspecting. Understand wisdom, and ye fools, be ye of an understanding heart. I had someone uh, write in to me uh, just recently, and I had called someone in, in a newsletter, I believe it was, a fool, and they called me out on calling a fool. And I know what they were talking about. They were talking about in the New Testament where it says, call no man fool, which is moros in the Greek language. But moros means someone, there is absolutely no hope for them. And we don't wanna give up hope on any of our brothers or sisters. Um, but 
Did God call or did wisdom call this one a fool? Yes. So I feel okay calling people a fool. But that doesn't mean that they're hopeless. Maybe they'll listen to wisdom. Maybe they'll listen to God's word and straighten up and change their ways to where they're not a moros, someone who has completely no hope. Hear, for I will speak and, uh, of excellent things. Wisdom speaks excellent things. And the opening of my lips, my words, in other words, shall be right things. Wisdom only speaks truth. For my mouth shall speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. This is wisdom speaking. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. They're, they're right. There is nothing froward or perverse in them. You can count on it. Froward means twisted or crafty. Wisdom has no intention of deceiving people. They are all plain. All the words of wisdom are plain to him that understandeth and right to them that find knowledge. Receive my instruction and not silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. Gehazi would rather receive silver and gold and not the word of God. We don't want to be that way. Knowledge of the word brings blessings and riches. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. Most valuable thing on earth is wisdom. No comparison. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence. You could think of prudence as discretion and find out knowledge of witty inventions. If you have prudence, uh, discretion, you intuitively know right from wrong. And you don't want to do wrong. Someone, uh, I use this quite often as an example, but it comes to mind. If, if, you, someone, if you buy something at a store and the person gives you too much change, you recognize that instantly and intuitively you say, no, no, you gave me too much here. Please take this back. You, you want it to be right. The fear of the Lord and the reverence of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy. And again, I said earlier, pride and arrogancy. The prime in the Hebrew of those two words is ga'ah. It's the same word, in other words, in the Hebrew. And the evil way and the froward or the deceitful lying mouth do I hate. God hates those things. We should hate those things. Counsel is mind and sound wisdom. I am understanding I have strength. And that's how Paul could say in the New Testament, when I am weak, then am I strong. Why? Because you turn it over to the Lord and then you have his strength. Pride and arrogance are characteristics of Satan. Both pride and arrogance lead to his very destruction. Turn with me with, to the book of Ezekiel 28. Chapter 28, Ezekiel, as we continue our study on arrogance. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, to Ezekiel, of course, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, because you have been arrogant, and thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, the highest form of arrogancy, claiming to be God. Yet thou art a man, in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 16, they'll look upon him and say, is this the man that caused the earth to tremble and the nations to shake? That's all he is, is a man. He's not a God. And not God, 
though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Isaiah chapter 14, uh, he also uh, states there where he's called Lucifer, that he will set his seat up on the north side. That's, there's only one problem with that. That's God's side. And he's going to exalt himself over all the, the children of God. It states there in Isaiah chapter 14. He's proud. He's arrogant. And note here he's called the prince of Tyrus. Uh, this is after he fell from the kingship, as we'll see in a later verse. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. In your own eyes, there's nobody as smart as you. And that's the way the devil thinks. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten the riches and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. The kind of wisdom that he has is not the kind of wisdom that we were talking about in Proverbs chapter 8. He's wise in the ways of the world. He knows how to manipulate people to his advantage. And all he wants is riches, gold and silver. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic, and where did that wisdom come from? Of course, God gave it to him, as we'll see. Hast thou increased thy riches, and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. Uh, the word heart is basically interchangeable with mind in the Hebrew. And he, lifted up means puffed up or proud, arrogant. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, you, you're going to play like you're God. Behold, therefore, I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness. This word defile could be translated wound. You heard of the deadly wound? The sword, Revelation chapter 1, verse 16. That two-edged sword of Jesus Christ, his tongue, his words, in other words, that cut both ways. They shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. He's going into the lake of fire. Wilt thou yet say before him, before Jesus, that slayeth thee, I am God? But thou shalt be a man and no God in the hand of him that slayeth thee. And be glad when we see that day, Satan destroyed in the lake of fire. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers. For I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Verse 11, moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, kind of switch gears here now, stay with it. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. We were talking about, we were talking about the prince of Tyrus. Now we go back in time to the first earth age, when indeed he was the king of Tyrus. And say unto him, thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum, or the pattern, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. That's the way God created Satan, full of wisdom, full of beauty. And, you know, Satan uh, at one point in time must have been a pretty good old boy. God promoted him to be the protecting cherub, to protect the mercy seat. But he went bad. <clears throat> Verse 13, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. He was there as the serpent. He was there as the tree of good and evil. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, that's the ruby, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle of gold, and gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets, 
and of thy pipes, this word pipes can be translated the brilliant side or the cut side of a precious stone, such as a diamond, was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Notice he wasn't born, he was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And God made him that way. Set him up to be the protector of the mercy seat. The problem is he didn't want to protect the mercy seat. He wanted to be the one sitting on the mercy seat, the place reserved for Jesus Christ. And I have set thee so. God did it. God made him that way. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity, that's perversity, evil, was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire, completely away from the altar of God. Demoted, thine heart was lifted up. This is why he was demoted. Thine heart was lifted up, pride and arrogance. Because of thy beauty, thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they, may, might, that they may behold thee. And that will happen when Revelation 12, uh, 9 comes to pass, when Michael boots uh, Satan out of heaven. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic, manipulating people even, trafficking people, Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I, God speaking, will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. Revelation 20:10. when he goes into that lake of fire. Prophesied in Psalm 37 as well. Psalm 37, as you know, is an acrostic psalm. And I love the final uh, leg of the uh, uh, prophecy there in verse 34. It's Psalm 37, 34. It states, and those of you who love and serve God will witness it. And a lot of people I hear them say, boy, I don't know if I'd want to see anybody go into the lake of fire. And I say, give me a front row seat when Satan goes in. I've seen what that rascal has done to my brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm ready to see him go into the lake of fire forever to ashes uh, and consumed from within. Jesus teaches us concerning pride and arrogancy in, in the book of Matthew. Let's go to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 23, I'm going to pick it up with verse 1. And if you're having trouble finding Matthew 23, it's right after Matthew 22. <laughs> now let's go with it. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples. This, this was meant for everyone to understand, including you saying the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. First Chronicles chapter uh, 2, verse 55, we learned that the Kenites had already worked their way in to be the scribes of Judah. That's hundreds and hundreds of years before this. And of course, who was Moses? Moses was the lawgiver. The Pharisees were supposedly religious leaders of, of Israel. Uh, unfortunately, they got off on the traditions of men uh, more than God's word. But they are taking the seat of the lawgiver 
Moses. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. They, they act really religious, but they don't practice what they preach. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders. God's word, truth, is supposed to set us free. John chapter eight, verse 32. But they bind people, laying burdens on their shoulders. But they themselves, the Pharisees and the scribes, will not move them with one of their fingers. They won't move, they won't even lift their little finger to lift these burdens that they're placing on other people. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. One-upmanship, ego trips. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. Uh, you have to understand the phylacteries, they're called frontlets in the Old Testament, translated uh, into English as frontlets. Now, there are four sets of scripture. Uh, Exodus chapter 13, verses three through 10, and then again, verses 11 through 16. Deuteronomy chapter six, verses four through nine, and Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 13 through 21. These scriptures that I just quoted or mentioned have one thing in common, and it's all teach your children. When your children see you celebrating the Passover, teach them, explain why we do this. Because God delivered our ancestors out of bondage. Now, they, these Scriptures were placed in leather boxes. As you know, uh, the, the one is placed on the forehead and secured around the head with a strap. The other is placed in the left hand and a long leather strap is used to wrap around. And of course, it's symbolic that the Word of God should be in your mind and you should do with your hands the Word of God. But these were symbols of being religious and as it said, these people were doing it to be seen of men. So it was important that they made their phylacteries larger where everybody would see and be impressed with how religious they were. He continues, Jesus, and love the uppermost rooms. They, they liked the honorable seats at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. They even wanted the seat of Moses, as it's stated in a previous verse. And greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. That's Master, Master. Uh, today, maybe some of them even like to be called Reverend. But be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your Master, even Christ. And all ye are brethren. Remember that verse when you start thinking you're more valuable than others. Or you're worth more than others. There's only one that was worthy of dying on the cross. That was Jesus Christ. All the rest of us are brethren. Just brothers. So don't honor or worship or make a reverend out of one of your brothers. Honor and glorify Christ. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven, the one who created your very soul. Neither be you called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. Again, don't reverence yourself, don't reverence other men. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Jesus washed the feet of the disciples. He served all of us by what he did, the price he paid on the cross for our sins. Verse 12, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. That's brought low. 
and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Paul warns us about Satan wanting to take God's seat in the book of Thessalonians. Turn there with me. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 in conclusion. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. You all are familiar with this chapter, I hope. It has, the subject is the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ at the second advent. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. That's the subject, the return of Jesus Christ, the second advent. Advent. No one's flying away, as it states in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 11. Jesus is returning to earth. It even tells us where there. The Mount of Olives is where he's going to return to earth. So if anybody's trying to talk you into flying away, say, no, I'm going to stay here and meet Jesus at the Mount of Olives. That ye be not soon shaken in mind. I want you to be ready is what Paul is saying. Or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. The day of the Lord. The millennium. The thousand years that you, many of you, will reign with Christ, as it states in Revelation chapter 20, uh, verse 4. The overcomers will reign with Christ that thousand years. Verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means. This word deceive is expateo. You know the word is translated beguiled in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, that Satan beguiled Mother Eve in the Garden of Eden. That word has only one meaning, expateo. It's holy. That's W-H-O-L-L-Y, seduced. That's what happened in the Garden of Eden. Satan seduced Mother Eve. For that day shall not come. The Lord's day is not going to come. Jesus is not going to return except or until there come a falling away first. This word in the Greek falling away is apostia. You can almost hear our English word apostasy in the Greek word. That man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Now let's see. A lot of people talk about who is the son of perdition. Well, we just read it in Ezekiel chapter 28. Satan is the only one who's sentenced by name to perish. That's what perdition means is to perish. Jesus Christ is not going to return at the second advent until that man of sin, the son of perdition, is revealed. And that is in the form of Antichrist, beloved. The reason we came here, verse 4, who opposeth and exalteth himself. He, he, he's arrogant. He's prideful. <clears throat> above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The height of arrogancy. The height of pridefulness. And as Christians, we should guard against, uh, make certain that we don't have one prideful or one arrogant bone in our body. Because if we exalt ourselves, what's going to happen? Jesus told you, you're going to be brought down. You're going to be abased. But if you humble yourself, then God will exalt you. Let's go to his throne. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word, Father. Your word that tells us how things are going to come down, Father. Uh, everyone gets excited and upset in the world. I think it's because they don't understand your word, Father. They don't know what the future holds and they're frightened. 
you have a group here, Father, that knows what happens on that day, the Lord's day, uh, and what happens before when that man of sin, the son of perdition, is revealed. And we will stand and witness against him for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, be with us. Let everything we do the rest of this day be a reflection of the love that is Jesus Christ. In Jesus' precious name, amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Let's teach the second grade students to spot false teachers and false doctrine. Always compare what is being taught with God's Word. If it doesn't stack up with the Bible, don't, don't, it's false. Uh, God's Word is truth. The Word is our basis for all teaching and that's, uh, as long as you'll stick with God's Word and of course with second graders uh, you want to keep it uh, interesting for second graders. You have to always consider your audience when you're teaching. Um, leave it at that. Marcia in Michigan. How many wives did Solomon have? And Solomon, it's written in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 3, had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And you know, in the book, of, of Deuteronomy chapter 17, God listed things that a king of Israel should do and things that the, a king of Israel should not do. Uh, one of the things that he was not to do was to multiply wives to himself. Now that doesn't mean that they didn't have multiple wives but they weren't to have a great multiplication of wives. I would say 700 wives and 300 concubines in God's eyes was overdoing it a bit on Solomon's part. And you know, that led to Solomon's downfall, if, if I can call it that. Uh, what happened was he got to bringing in foreign wives and they brought their foreign gods with them and set up altars even on uh, the Mount of Olives and Mount Zion. And Solomon uh, gave in to them and started worshiping their gods. That's uh, uh, not a good thing. It was for that reason that the nation of Israel was split. Uh, God took the 10 northern tribes away from Judah uh, because of Solomon's actions. Amos in Colorado, since I've been watching you on TV, I have given my life back to Jesus Christ. I appreciate the chapel and bless you all. You're the best teachers I've ever heard. And you know, thanks for sharing that witness. And, and I, I read that because many of you, we, we don't often share uh, the witnesses that we get, positive feedback, encouragement from people, that, that God's Word changes lives. And, and I just wanted to share that with you. And, and it's not uncommon that we get a letter of this statement. It is uncommon that we share it uh, with the audience. But I think it's important to do occasionally uh, to remind us that, that, this, this, that God's Word changes people's lives for the better. Uh, Ida Marie, I think. When I was about 16, the preacher asked for everyone to come up to the front. 
I felt that I wanted to go up, but I did not. Is this the unpardonable sin? Of course not. The, the unforgivable sin, it's impossible that anyone has committed that at this point in time, Eda. Uh, Luke chapter 12, verses 10 through 13 is one of the places you can read in God's Word about the unforgivable sin. What is the unforgivable sin? It's to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And that means it's when, when one of God's elect is delivered up before Satan in the synagogue of Satan for a witness and to refuse the Holy Spirit uh, to speak through them, that cloven tongue that everyone can understand is blaspheme of the Holy Spirit. It's for one of God's elect to refuse the Holy Spirit when they are delivered up. Uh, Charlie in North Carolina, please explain what the dead in Christ means. And you're probably pulling from 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, verse 16. In fact, if you back up one, a few more verses to verse 13, you learn what the subject of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, what the rapturists usually pull from, claiming that there is a rapture. But the subject is, I don't want you, the teachings of Paul, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning where those who are asleep in Christ are. And that means those who are dead. And in verse 16, the dead in Christ are those who died believing in Christ. And it states there that those of us who remain alive in the flesh until Christ returns cannot precede uh, which is a, a prevent, which is an old English word that means precede. We can't precede those who have died in Christ. Why? Because they're already there with Him. In verse 15, it goes on to say, those of us who are alive until the coming of Christ shall not prevent or precede them. That's who the dead in Christ are, those who died believing in Jesus Christ. Jeremiah in California, Isaiah 28, verses 10 and 13. Please explain what this scripture means. It means God's word should be taught chapter by chapter, verse by verse. It states there, precept upon precept, line upon line. And, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with doing a Sunday, uh, or I should say a sermon, uh, an hour sermon on a subject matter and, and skip around in God's Word from, for d different uh, places in God's Word that speaks of the subject that you've chosen or God has given you, more importantly, for a Sunday sermon or a, a sermon period. But uh, when you're teaching God's Word, it becomes important that you teach chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Um, that is where I think a lot of people fall down uh, in educating others about God's Word. They never get around to teaching chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Lillian in Ohio, it is about doing, I have a question, it is about doing good deeds the ones we already have done and the ones that we will continue to do about being dressed in fine linen clothings. What about the ones that did not do any good works? What will they wear? Uh, there won't be any stores. Please explain. Well, you're right. There won't be any stores where you can buy uh, the righteous uh, clothing acts that brought your long white linens. I did uh, a Sunday message not too long ago entitled Naked, and that is what those who don't have righteous works, as we learn in, in Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, or is it 13, 14, uh, I may stand corrected, but your, your works are all that you can take with you. I believe it's chapter 14, verse 13. Um, and then in Revelation 16, 15, um, those that didn't have that walked naked and ashamed. So 
Uh, that's the way it is. You, you can have a long white robe uh, based on your good works, or you can not do good works and be naked as a jaybird. Elaine in Pennsylvania, what happens to a bipolar person who denies God after they have been raised in the church? Will God have mercy or will they lose their salvation? God knows our strengths. Uh, he knows our handicaps. He's very fair. Uh, he, he is a compassionate God. He is a God that loves his children. He's not up there looking around for people to zap, which unfortunately many churches uh, lead their congregation or hold their congregation uh, in their pews out of the fear of hellfire and brimstone. And they're missing out because the key of teaching God's Word is teaching His love uh, because He does love His children. He's not looking for people to zap. Um, I'll leave it at that. Lewis in Wisconsin, is it permissible to use regular bread or even a piece of candy as one pastor told me for communion or does it have to be unleavened bread? I wouldn't use a piece of candy as a holy sacrament. You know, if you wish, a piece of soda cracker is suitable for, uh, or grape juice or red wine in the holy sacraments when you take communion. But I would not use a piece of candy. I, you know, and it is symbolic, I imagine, is what this other preacher was thinking. So uh, perhaps a piece of candy, it doesn't matter, it's symbolic. But it's the bread of life, so I would go with bread. I'm out of time. I want you to know that I love you a great deal because you enjoy studying God's Word. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. Most important, the beloved, this, you stay in His Word every day. Every day in your Father's Word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? It's because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.